I know it always always takes people a minute to get settled. Uh, let me apologize for not speaking in Italian. My Italian is very limited. <laughs> I have a colleague at Yale who's a surgeon, and he writes short stories. And he has a wonderful short story about a lady from Italy who comes to New Haven. There's actually a fairly large Italian population in New Haven. And this lady comes to him to talk about having her gallbladder removed. And he prides himself on his functional, sorry, he prides himself on his functional Italian, all of which has been learned from the Grand Opera. <laughs> and so this lady is coming to him. She speaks not a word of English. And he's telling her as best he can in Italian. And so he's using words like mia sposa and trottator. And then he says, sangue, sangue. The lady flees his office. So I apologize that my Italian is on that order, and I will not try to talk in Italian. Uh, let me say a little bit in terms of conflicts of interest, which I think are thought of differently in Europe than they are in the States. Uh, in the States, we mention anything that might be seen as a conflict of interest. The main thing you want to know is this book, which is actually written. It's a book by myself and my wife for parents. And some of what I'm going to talk about today is actually out of that book. And the idea for doing this book was to be able to write something translating what we know from research into language that parents and teachers could use. And also, it's highly purchasable. It costs about $16, which was the other uh, consideration. Anytime I write an academic book, it's much more expensive. And we lost, by the way, unfortunately, my first slide here. But let me mention the website. Uh, if you want to go to our website, within about a week, I will have these slides posted on that website. And you can see them. Hopefully, they'll be on this website as well. But our website is www.autism.com. Dot FM, like the radio, FM. So I want to say a little bit today about the changes in our understanding in autism, uh, changes in outcome and economics, and then to say a little bit of what we've learned and what that tells us about as we move along as children are getting older and becoming adolescents and young adults, and then say a little bit about translating research into practice. So some paradoxes and some challenges. Autism was once thought to be rare. We now think of it, especially in the broad sense, as fairly common. There are many challenges for research, and there are many more challenges for translating research into practice. Much of the research that's been done over the years, especially in recent years, has focused on very young children. Treatment research, and I'm going to show you a slide in a second, is even more limited. Uh, there's increasingly, I don't know about in this, uh, in Europe and in the United States, an emphasis on evidence-based treatment. And often, the degree of, to which we can have evidence base is really quite variable, especially if you start to look at uh, things like age and levels of functioning. And finally, there are some issues in terms of diagnostic um, implications for think thinking about changes. This has to do with things like DSM-5 and what will be ICD-11. Let me just point out, and I emphasize these are data from Medline. You will get different results if you use different search engines. But this is an engine that's on the internet. These are the number of papers, research papers, peer-reviewed papers, published in autism between 1943 and 1999. And you can see a gradual increase. This is by a blocks of about five years. Now, we go to blocks of every year. This is 2000 to 2009. In 2009, about 1,600 papers were published. I'm sure people in the room have read every 1,600 paper, right? Uh, that presents itself. It's good news, but it's also a challenge. Why has research increased? Well, there's much more intellectual interest. There's more understanding of how the brain works. Autism is increasingly seen as a social, uh, as a model disorder. There also are social and political reasons. So there are important parent report, parent supports and foundations. Uh, there are financial reasons. There's a famous American, people in Europe won't have heard of him, named Willie Sutton. And Willie Sutton developed something called Sutton's Law. Sutton's Law in the United States goes like this. They once asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks. And Willie Sutton said, because that's where the money is. Well, the money has gone more towards autism research. I'll show you a slide in just a second, and that's good news. But that means, again, we have more and more research to interpret. We also have more media attention. And if we get a chance, I'll talk some about the internet. 
This slide is from the Congress, actually. It's not from the executive branch of the federal government, but it shows us the increases in autism research at NIH over a period from 2000 to 2005. And you can see a gradual expansion. So that by 2005, they're spending almost $100 million a year. That sounds like and is a lot of money. On the other hand, one of the schools I consult to in New Haven, which is a lovely school, small residential program, a larger day school for fairly impaired children with autism, about 60 or 70 children, its budget's about $15 million a year. So it's an interesting you know, set of issues. Challenges for research, the federal funding process of the United States is very complicated. It's not perfect. To get money to do research, you have to have done the research, which is paradoxical. Uh, there are many challenges for treatment studies. We often have access getting to the most important group. And I think especially in the United States, there's been a challenge in terms of a lack of a mandate for translating research into social policy. I think that's somewhat different in Europe. I certainly know in Great Britain when I review grants, there'll be a little section of the grant review that says, have they done a good job about talking about how they translate this knowledge into the real world? If you look at the treatment studies, I mentioned that these had sort of a lack of growth. This shows that same data. This is now from Psych Info, but this is the number of papers going up, but the black bar shows the treatment studies. So that you can see the treatment studies unfortunately have somewhat lagged behind. Economic issues. Uh, there have been several studies, both in the United States and Great Britain. Autism is a costly disorder. In the, in the United States, it was estimated in 2006 that about $3 million would be typically spent on an individual child with autism over the course of their lifetime. Uh, NAP suggested that in the United Kingdom, they were spending about 25 billion pounds a year for autism-related care. So this is not a trivial economic problem. We also know much more about outcome. Uh, Dr. Pat Hallen, who I know is here, I managed to see her last night just briefly, did a lovely review in 2005 for the Handbook of Autism. She made the point that outcome is getting better. We have more people talking than used to talk. People have higher levels of IQ. There are still some issues in terms of understanding what normal is. But we know that changes have happened in my country. Uh, there was a law, Public Law 94-142, that for the first time as a matter of law gave the child to, with autism the right to an education. Up to that time, schools could refuse to service children with autism. After that time, it's illegal. It's against the law. If they do it, they have to give back all their federal money. So that this really marked a watershed. And the similar things I know have happened in the UK and are now starting to happen in other parts of Europe. As we look at this data, I emphasize this is complicated stuff to look at where sometimes uh, averaging apples and oranges, but it's important to try to look at it. And I'm using Pat Hallen's uh, review as a summary here. She uses three levels of outcome, good, fair, and poor. Good means the person as an adult is largely independent. Fair means they're semi-independent. And poor means they're pretty much not independent. And I'm cherry-picking studies. These are studies from 1956 to 1974. And again, this is from Pat Hallen's chapter. You can see here the number of these studies where the individual as an adult had a good outcome. Averaging, well, maybe around 6, 7, 8 percent. And here we are from 1989 to 2003, and look at that number. We're now talking 25, sometimes even 30 percent of children becoming as adults self-sufficient and independent. Changes in outcome probably reflect several things. There certainly are earlier interventions now. We're picking up children. We're commonly seeing children at my clinic at less than a year of age. We also know there have been some changes in the way the diagnosis is thought of. That may account for some of the difference, but actually not much of it probably. We also know that not every child gets better even when given good treatments. Often there are individuals in matching children to treatment, and unfortunately not so much work on older individuals and adults. Uh, for anyone who's interested, especially if you read English, this is an excellent resource. 
Educating Children with Autism. It's a report for the National Research Council in the United States. It looks at all the programs around the country in the United States that seem to have some data to show they work for children with autism. And it makes several points in terms of looking at what works, having structured programs. There are many things in common and a few differences. Getting to children early, using drug treatments appropriately. And again, it's a whole nice summary of all the research that's done. Um, if you look, the kinds of things that have been effective, various models, behavioral, uh, ABA approaches, the eclectic approaches, things like uh, Division Teach in North Carolina, some of the more developmental approaches like the Sally Rogers Denver model. But there are different approaches that can be used, different settings, home, school, and center base. On average, that report says that about 25 hours a week of services is what seems to be associated with getting better. It also makes the point that not every child gets better, even with a good program. To sum up the way that report says that this thing works in a nutshell, it says autism is a disorder that impacts on development and learning. On the other hand, learning happens, development happens. What we want to do from the point of view of intervention is this. Minimize any negative effects autism has for other kinds of learning and maximize as much as we can normative developmental processes. As you heard, there are many issues in terms of health care. Fortunately, there are more and more resources. There are books, media. There's a lovely program for your iPhone called iPromps. If you haven't seen it, go take a look. It's that app for your iPhone. You can embed pictures. You can show the child ahead of time what's going to happen. It has a visual schedule. You can have video recordings. Many, many, many wonderful technological resources. We do still need to educate medical health care providers, unfortunately. That's a big part of the equation that's been left out. We also need to look at other things like dental care. I cannot tell you the number of adults I see who have to go through general anesthesia to have a tooth filled or have a cleaning. We also know there are some medical problems more common to autism, and I'll say a little bit more about them. This is one of them, seizures. This data shows here the two uh, bars in blue and purple, data on rates of onset of epilepsy in two large samples of children with autism from New Haven and Boston. And the green bar shows data from Cooper, uh, from the Public Health Service in Great Britain, of the normal rates of onset in the normal population of epilepsy. And you can see higher rates for children with autism across the board, including into adolescence and later life. Safety issues. This is another area that often gets, gets neglected. Uh, accidents are the most common cause of early death in autism. Drowning, running across the street, bolting. Uh, this is very important because there are more and more resources in terms of preventing this. Uh, in our book, we actually devote a whole chapter to this topic. And again, there are some computer resources. There are now virtual reality computer programs that help children with autism learn things, for example, like how do you cross the street? Many behavioral and psychi issues, uh, psychiatric issues, of course, come up. Often these become somewhat worse in adolescence, uh, as you've heard this morning and elsewhere during the conference. This is a very complicated area of work. On the one hand, we have this problem of what's called comorbidity, understanding what does it mean to have autism and something else, like anxiety or attention disorder. The other problem is that sometimes the autism is so impressive as a problem, it overshadows other difficulties. And people don't notice things that are there. And of course, there are challenges sometimes in communicating with our patients, and also, unfortunately, especially in lack of integration of treatment providers. We do have a number of medications in the, U the US which are approved for the use in autism, some of them officially approved. Many, label, many medicines are used what is called off-label. Off-label means it's out there, it can be prescribed, but it hasn't been shown to be effective in autism. We have more and more research that's being done. That being said, unfortunately, the drug research is still relatively limited. 